thanks so much for giving me this opportunity to um, catch up with you about the last year and a half or so of um, what's going on since I became SD in the intramural research program. So um, as I discussed with you last year, I'm like most of you I'm from the extramural world for 35 years of my career. And uh, one of the things that's really striking is just how different really the intramural program is uh, from, um, from the extramural world. Uh, not the least in terms of the, the way that the campus is, is assembled. I mean, so this is the Bethesda campus has over 25,000 scientists and uh, we're, we're all in the same place, which is kind of nirvana. Um, and uh, the NINDS portion of the intramural is located in three buildings, the laboratories um, in three buildings, clinical center, which is building 10, uh, and then um, buildings 49 and Porter or building 35 as, as illustrated here. And you can see they're all sort of um, clustered, you know, in a, in a straight three minute walk from one another. So it's kind of great. The really unique features about, about the intramural program are that it's a completely different kind of, of um, process of, of exploration. Um, investigators are encouraged uh, to do high risk, high reward because it's really the investigator, not the individual project um, that is um, uh, receiving, receiving the support. And so this kind of um, configuration really changes sort of the, the whole milieu. It obviously gives um, a tremendous advantage of, of stability or um, in terms of conducting the science in a, in a relatively um, stable uh, funding environment. It also allows for a lot of flexibility so that one can be rapidly responsive to new ideas or emerging medical challenges, um, new technological developments, et cetera. And, and this obviously has been particularly pertinent this last year um, with the COVID situation. The synergies are spectacular. There's tremendous amounts of interactions across the institutes. Um, uh, and, and it's just, it's just excellent going all the way, you know, from very fundamental neuroscience uh, to clinical research. Um, and, and in fact, Building 10 is kind of renowned, the clinical center is renowned worldwide um, for its first in human um, uh, contributions. It's also, I think, an optimal environment for career development. Um, as, since we're doing really cutting edge work, um, cutting edge neuroscience, and, and um, I think that it's really both uh, our responsibility and our ability to um, participate in producing the really the best, um, most diverse uh, next generation of, of neuroscientists. And with these advantages, I think there also comes responsibility. Um, and that is that we really need to serve and try to serve as a model of best practices in conducting the research and in sustaining a, a really healthy and supportive um, workplace climate. And, and this has been um, uh, particularly uh, a focus of, of this year. So what I'm gonna talk to you about are sort of a, a potpourri of, <laughs> of highlights and, and challenges that we've faced in, in 2019, 2020 with um, my goal always having been focused on optimizing the intramural research programs, um, scientific programs. So I'm gonna cover um, a, a few topics. Um, all of this is encased in, in a, um, a very explicit um, and, uh, and actually rewarding strategic planning pro um, process. And um, I'm gonna talk a bit about enhancing workplace culture, about the new faculty and promotions uh, that we've done I will talk about um, our COVID response uh, and our return to physical workspace um, issues, since that's um, an experience we all share, but again, uh, a little different in the IRP. Um, and then I want to turn to changes that we've made in terms of the program evaluations. We have a very important evaluation committee called the Board of Scientific Counselors, um, which Tim Ryan um, was a member of. And um, uh, that process has, has been streamlined and, and, um, uh, and, and I, I think optimized, made a little more transparent and uh, accelerated. I'm gonna talk a little bit about organizational improvements. And finally, I'm going to end with um, new initiatives uh, and, and uh, changes in the facilities and infrastructure. And of course, with questions to you. So I'm gonna start with the strategic plan because you can't do anything if you don't plan for it. Um, and this plan I think is really unique in that uh, the Institute is working very hard to make the strategic plan that involves both the extramural research program and the intramural research program a unified thing. So we're really working together to put this um, uh, strategic plan um, with an overall view um, towards, the, towards the Institute. So uh, the overall goals, which are you know, very broad, were set, of course, um, by leadership and they're, they're extremely broad. And then we brought in task force to really begin the process of, of analysis and implementation. 
um, with respect to approaches. So these are in the general areas of science, including the science training, um, the communications, and uh, workplace culture. So these are the, the big rubrics. There's only one committee actually that is separated between intramural and extramural, although there's some um, crosstalk between the committees, and that is the, the science planning, specifically you know, the topics and directions that we're going to go in. Um, so for that, there is a committee that's primarily intramural and a separate committee that's primarily extramural. All of the other committees are combined. Um, so training, communications, and workplace culture all have representatives from both the intramural and the extramural program. And it really has been a remarkably cohesive process of working with each other and learning from each other quite a bit. <laughs> I've learned a lot um, in, in terms of putting this together. So you can't have a future without a plan and you can't have a plan without a budget. Um, and so um, we, of course, are, uh, work within um, uh, the, um, the constraints of, of, the, of the NINDS budget. The overall budget is 2.4 billion, as you know, Walter um, mentioned that um, earlier. Uh, the uh, intramural research program gets 199 million, uh, and that is divided up in um, sort of the way the pie is illustrated here. Now, obviously my goal, is to try to keep as much of the resources um, going for the scientific programs and uh, to do so by uh, minimizing administrative um, uh, issues and, and really looking for operational efficiencies. And so, um, the, but unfortunately, the bad news um, is that um, we really do have a challenge. Our indirect costs, which have the nickname of TAPS um, at NIH, it's basically the same thing, it's a tax, um, continue to really increase at, um, at, a, at a level uh, and a rate that is more so than the um, rate for the, uh, for the budget. But we're um, doing our best and focusing on the 19% or so of the budget that is at play for efficiencies. And I think that we've you know, really been able to implement um, quite a few actually just with, within the last year and a half. So I wanna talk a bit about workplace culture. I think the most important thing in science is talking to people and um, and uh, so we're really trying to encourage a lot more sort of mixing and just you know, interactions between people in neuroscience. And, and one needs to realize that the thing that's really great about um, uh, neuroscience at, um, in, the, in the intramural program is that this, it's not just NINDS. So it's not just um, uh, that organization. There are neuroscientists within 13 other institutes and centers that are listed here actually um, all over campus. And, We've worked very hard. There's a very strong culture of it being neuroscience at NIH, where one of the sort of subject areas that really tries to work between institutes and centers and, and get some, um, some continuity. So we established a Neuro Fridays at Four, which is basically a cooking contest <laughs> um, between people. And, and before COVID, it looked like you know any other wonderful social gathering that we had. And of course, we, we missed this quite a bit. Um, and uh, and, and since COVID, we're, we're doing what everybody is doing, um, which is gathering virtually. And, uh, and it, it you know, doesn't have quite the same feel, but, um, but you know, we're, still, we're still persisting and having these open conversations, even with very large um, uh, groups. So it's been a super busy year in terms of the last, um, uh, in terms of promotions um, and, and hiring. We have several new um, assistant clinical investigators who's promoted from staff clinician um, to ACI, uh, Drs. Noom, um, Cortese, and Anati. Uh, we have several new tenure track investigators who were promoted from assistant clinical investigators to tenure track. That's Drs. Chibonia, Jackson, and Narendra. We also have two new basic science um, tenure track investigators, uh, two women, uh, Drs. Gu and Pu. And um, I'm extremely proud um, to uh, note um, that um, really spectacular scientists that have been on the tenure track are now um, tenured uh, senior investigators, um, Dr. Zay Kalik and uh, uh, Dr. Wei Lu. So it's been a very busy year in terms of putting together uh, personal packages <laughs> and letters. Okay, so let me tell you just a little bit about what we did for the COVID response. I know we've all been through this. Um, I'm just sort of hoping that maybe uh, by giving you some of the details of, of how we dealt with it in the IRP that you know, we might be able to have some dialogue uh, with respect to helping each other. So the um, NINDS um, VIR management in terms of the response procedures, we really had to sort of deal with two things. 
One is that the overall population of the NINDS uh, intramural staff is about, it's about 1,500 people. Um, and we're spread out in multiple buildings. The, the laboratories are concentrated within the non asterisk ones there, to 10, um, 35, 49, and, and there's one investigator at Fisher's Lane. Uh, so those are, you know, that's really where the return to work um, actually focused. And um, in addition, uh, my responsibility um, as the SD of NINDS is that I'm also the lead um, institute uh, uh, for, the, for building 35 for Porter this completely um, intermixed uh, building. So it's sort of two, two sets of challenges and, um, oops, and uh, we took, um, we did it in basically two phases. Um, <clears throat> one, as you all um, went through as well, is minimal maintenance and mission critical work only. This is where we reduced down to um, uh, an absolute um, minimal amount of what was, was needed and focused entirely um, on work that was related um, only to COVID. And uh, the second phase was once we got to think about the return to the physical workspace, um, this was done in a step-by-step -step, uh, manner. And so those, um, at, that involved obviously a lot of good communication, a lot of supplies, um, providing, getting them to everybody. Um, and um, just in the spirit of now being a full-blown government employee, um, I wrote, a, I think it's a 119-page report that's um, on the PNRC RTPW Group A, Return of Porter uh, to the Physical Workspace. So the reason that, that 35 is, is such a, a challenge is, you know, one of the most wonderful things in the world are open labs. And this is an open and intercalated lab space. So the PIs are from multiple institutes and they each report to different scientific directors. And that's more of a thing than, than one I think. Um, so what you're seeing here is just one half of one floor and the laboratories are in pods that are all open and connected. And the laboratories are completely open within, within these pods. Uh, and you can see from the color coding that there are multiple institutes within each pod. I mean, there's some simple pods where there are just two, but for the most part, they're literally intercalated with one another. So we had to work together with the other institutes, with the other SDs, to really make sure that we were having optimal communication. So um, communication is indeed the key. And uh, uh, there were several um, aspects of this that had been set up prior to COVID and others that we implemented um, as a function thereof. Uh, so I had set up an OSD Executive Advisory Council, which is a mixed group of PIs, mostly PIs, um, and, um, and some uh, higher level operations um, people. Uh, and we've always had um, faculty meetings, and uh, we have them every month, um, come hell or high water. Uh, and, and we also then implemented a sort of all hands meetings that were done uh, by Zoom. So these really implemented the communication and the planning, and we got a lot of input, um, which was really essential. I had also organized before um, a Porter IC governance group, fondly referred to by my, me as big. Um, and uh, we focused our meetings, um, this group had existed before, but we focused our meetings entirely on COVID response related um, activities um, starting in, um, in, in mid-April, sharing um, positive cases, et cetera. Uh, we then formed the NINDS Return to Physical Workspace Working Group, which is an incredible group, um, again, of, of a mixture of scientists and, and, um, and operations types. And this was really critical in terms of um, developing the return to work plan that, that document and to really ensure and support um, safety, which is really, has been really, really critical. So that's the approach we've taken. And it's actually, I think, been remarkably effective. We are back at um, a 50% uh, occupancy level. Another really important part of life um, in the intramural program is um, how we're evaluated and how um, we're advised. And uh, this, is, this is a really important process that involves the Board of Scientific Counselors, uh, of which Tim uh, was a member. And, um, and, and there, were, there were some things that needed to be done in terms of making it more efficient for the BSC people, making it more transparent um, uh, to people in the, in the program, and really making it a better sort of advisory um, uh, context for, uh, for information and in terms of accelerating things. So that's really what, um, I focused on is trying to um, develop a process that accelerates um, the, you know, the gaps between um, putting in a request for um, uh, resources and, and then ultimately getting the allocation. 
So this is the, the modified timeline and the you know, um, time bar is two weeks. So uh, I get draft reports from the PIs. Um, I then give them their input on those drafts, return them to the PIs. They then um, submit their final report, um, including their request for resources to the BSC. Uh, and then the BSC meeting is T equals zero. Right before that, I have now a, um, a meeting with, uh, it's a phone meeting with the, um, with the members of the BSC, new members in particular, just you know, guidelines and frequently asked questions so that everybody is kind of on the same page with respect to the process. After the BSC meeting, quite quickly usually, um, we get a final report, um, which then goes to the PI. And after that, there are sort of two events that are quite important, which is that there is a post-BSC meeting. And this is a meeting privately between just the PI um, and all of the directors. We all attend. And then finally, the last step is that I write up a memo which details the activities, you know, the discussion of the post-BSC meeting, brings in the final report, and um, gives the dispensation in terms of allocation of, of resources. So we're down to about nine to 12 weeks from the request of the PI to the actual allocation. Critical, obviously, in terms of flexibility. So this is just another way of presenting how we're trying to accelerate the timeline. I'm gonna skip through this. Um, but my goal is to get it to between two and three weeks from the BSC review to the written post-BSC memo that actually um, uh, awards um, or, or doesn't um, the, uh, the, the resources. That's um, quite a change from you know, an average of about 11 months. So it was about a year or so for allocations. Um, now it's about to th down to three months and I'm working for two. Okay, while we're on the BSC, I thought I'd give you just a miniature update on, um, on some of the NINDS intramural research programs that are going on. And in particular, I just wanted to exemplify, uh, give you some summary of programs that are really exemplify kind of the utility of this program flexibility. Um, and um, the ability of individuals to really dive in um, with their research strength. So the first one I'm gonna to talk to you about is um, a, a program by David uh, Brody, uh, who has developed camelid uh, nanobodies to try to counter COVID. Uh, another is by Catherine Roche on um, receptor expression and targeting. And the third is um, even more depthful um, and um, surprising studies for, on iron channel um, function by Kim Sports. So the um, nanobody project uh, that uh, David Brody initiated is essentially based on the fact that um, spike protein, which is very important for the um, infection, uh, interacts with um, angiotensin converting enzyme as its sort of receptor. And so based on that, uh, he has been trying to target something that would interfere uh, effectively with that interaction. So ACE2, as you all know, it's expressed on um, uh, the epithelium um, of alveoli. And this is how the virus gains entry um, into the um, uh, um, alveolar endothelium, ep epithelium. Uh, so he developed these in llama. So I like to call them llama lids, but I'm told that's not correct. It's just llama lids. OK. Uh, by <laughs> the normal library construction, you know, um, panning and expression, these are very high affinity uh, nanobodies. They're around four nanomolar um, in terms of their binding. And then when he does functional assays, of looking at cells that have been transfected with um, ACE receptor and looks at the ability of these nanobodies to interfere with the internalization indicated by the expression of RFP protein, uh, he finds that um, that has a very uh, high affinity, very efficient um, blocking um, of the interaction between spike, the spike protein and um, uh, the human ACE2 receptor. The idea is to deliver this by um, a nebulizer um, and, uh, and, and that does not seem to adversely affect the activity. In fact, this is the most potent therapeutic um, agent that's been tested to date um, at NIHS. So um, we're pretty excited about that. On a different topic um, <laughs> completely, um, Dr. Roche has been working for some time on really the cell biology and um, uh, molecular biology of, of uh, signaling mechanisms, <clears throat> and in particular, her work has turned to um, studies of, um, a, of autism spectrum disorder and looking at some of the molecular uh, substrates of it. So neural ligands, as you all know, are critically important proteins for the establishment and maintenance of, of synapses. And what um, Dr. Roche and colleagues found is that the X-linked version of neural ligand 4, one of the neural ligands, very efficiently traffics to the surface. However, 
the um, Y-linked version uh, of neuregulin-4 does not get to the surface. And it turns out that that's due to a single amino acid difference. So if one substitutes um, the uh, um, back or proline that's supposed to be there into the serine side of the Y, you get just as good surface level expression as, um, as one gets with the X-linked uh, version. Now this is particularly interesting and important because there are a cluster of neuregulin um, uh, 4X uh, um, uh, autism mutants, the variants that really surround this critical site where there's this amino acid difference. So um, the, the thought is this could have implications for that. Okay, I'm gonna turn now quickly to um, Kenton Swartz's work on, um, on KV channels. Uh, these are fascinating and um, uh, amazing channels for a million and one reasons, um, not the least of which is they control excitability of cells, uh, but they're also expressed in lots of other types of cells, including beta cells of the pancreas and, and um, and they're um, also at intracellular junctions between um, ER and, and, and other um, subcellular organelles. So they're, they're really super interesting. Um, mutations in them lead to seizure problems, et cetera. But one of the areas that's just been really, really difficult to approach is what, what is the role of the lipids in which you know, this channel is completely embedded uh, in terms of regulating channel activity? Now, a while ago, um, uh, Swartz and, and colleagues and others um, demonstrated that sphingomyelin is a potent regulator of neuronal KV2.1 um, KV channels, um, showing in particular that if one used uh, um, sphingomyelin ACE D, that you get an enormous enhancement of the activation of the channel. And so the mystery has been, well, where is the, the lipid? Where is it sitting? And how is it doing um, this uh, regulatory activity? And recently, um, Swartz have, at, at all have um, been able to obtain a cryo-EM structure um, of the open version of KV2.1. And, and this um, is being investigated for shedding light on the mechanisms of um, activation gating and, and, and the lipid regulation. Okay, so moving on to organizational improvements. Quickly, I'll, um, oops, I'll blow through this. Uh, I just want to emphasize the fact that um, uh, I'm very committed to transparency, communication, and, and really making sure that um, things are improving in terms of the interaction between the scientists and the Office of the Scientific Director. So that, you know, that's, that's really important um, uh, and to have these kinds of improvements and efficiencies in, in terms of really making the environment as optimally creative as, um, as is possible. So I've done this by a number of groups that, as I said, involve both scientists and um, uh, more administrative facilities operations type people. So um, the executive advisory group, we have scientific program coordinators, um, uh, research um, training um, working group that's, that are all a mix. And then these are all now interfacing, I think, um, much more effectively with the people who are in you know, budget administrative operations and research facilities management. So there's really much more of a hub um, through the Office of the Scientific Director. And um, as you can see, I love to talk, so that's not a problem. Um, key element of the organizational improvements is that yes, it enhances the creativity. The other thing that really enhances creativity, as we all know, is to enhance the diversity and improve the climate. Um, and, and the goal here is to do so in both fundamental and clinical neuroscience research programs. There are, um, NINDS specific processes that have been introduced or emphasized um, in the domain of um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, EDI. Um, and uh, some of those involve interaction with the NIH wide um, uh, services. Others are um, that we've implemented a council on residence, a peer advisor, as it were, um, for um, ongoing consultation. And um, we are using more professional coaches and counselors to be sure that people are learning what they need to learn um, to be really good managers. And, and most of all, I think has been a really highly stated commitment to um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, not only at the training level, but also at the career development and career um, uh, achievement <laughs> uh, level. So, so really, you know, we've got to get um, uh, this right um, at all levels. Okay, so finally, I'll um, stop with the new initiatives and facilities just briefly before I ask you for your input. Um, we, of course, here again, the goal is to strengthen both fundamental and the clinical neuroscience researchers and, and to really enhance the interactions um, between, uh, between these groups. 
Uh, the recruitment areas that we have focused on so far have been primarily systems neurobiology with human translation. Um, we are uh, putting some emphasis on the Marmoset program. And in addition, we've been recruiting in structural molecular neurobiology um, with a particular emphasis on imaging, neurotomography, cryo EM, et cetera. Uh, have implemented, we have implemented in the OSD um, a, a new series of special collaborative initiatives um, and interest groups. These again are mechanisms for um, stimulating or incentivizing with dollar signs for the S's, um, HRHR based um, collaborations, basic clinical collaborations by funding them, money tends to do that. Um, and uh, in addition, I just want to quickly mention the um, CARD, the Center for um, Alzheimer's Disease and, and Related Dementias, uh, which represents a, a, a large collaboration with the National Institute of Aging with NINDS. So this is going to be an intramural um, sort of hub uh, for um, uh, AD related uh, activities. And finally, there's been a considerable investment in the core facilities and various user groups um, and uh, that both at, at NIH, um, in, the individual institutes provide um, uh, certain services and they participate in NIH-wide ones. Um, we, we also do both. <laughs> We've been enhancing our um, imaging facility quite a lot with um, purchase of a, uh, a cryo-EM for our investigators. And in addition, there is, uh, we participate actively and extensively in the um, MICEF, which is a consortium of uh, institutes and centers that um, are also focused on um, uh, imaging uh, technology. So my questions for you are, what do you think um, in terms of areas in basic and clinical neuroscience that we should be really pursuing? Um, how do I better message the strengths of this program? I think it's so unique and I, I mean, I can't believe I, spent 36 years, even serving on BSC and not understanding how incredibly cool um, the intramural program really is. And uh, how do I go about attracting the best of the best to better engage intramural mission? Thank you for your attention and I'm sorry for going over.